Good evening, Sanbonani Dumelang. I greet you today on a very special day as we celebrate Women's Month. Today marks the first day of Women's Month in South Africa and we celebrate sisters, we celebrate mothers, we celebrate daughters who are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. I bring you the word of God this evening from Numbers, Numbers chapter 27, and I read from verse 1 to verse 11. And the title there is The Daughters of Zelophehad. Mala, Noah, Holger, Milka, and Tiza were the daughters of Zelophehad, son of Hepher, son of Gilead, son of Maki, son of Manasseh, son of Joseph. They went and stood before Moses, Eleazar the priest, the leaders, and the whole community at the entrance of the tent of the Lord's presence and said, Our father died in the wilderness without leaving any sons. He was not among the followers of Korah who rebelled against the Lord. He died because of his own sin. Just because he had no sons, why should our father's name disappear from Israel? Give us property among our father's relatives. Moses presented their case to the Lord, and the Lord said to him, What the daughters of Zelophehad request is right. Give them property among their father's relatives. Let his inheritance pass to them. Tell the people of Israel that whenever a man dies without leaving a son, his daughter is to inherit his property. If he has no daughter, his brothers are to inherit it. If he has no brothers, his father's brothers are to inherit it. If he has no brothers or uncles, then his nearest relative is to inherit it and hold it as his own property. The people of Israel are to observe this. And this is a legal, a legal requirement. Just as I, the Lord, have commanded you. This is the word of the Lord. Friends, this evening I would like us to reflect on the passage that I have read from the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 27, verse 1 to 11. The book of Numbers is a recording of the history of the Israelites as they journeyed in the wilderness towards the promised land. The Hebrew name for the book is Bamidba, which is derived from Midba. And Midba translated to English is wilderness. So the book contains events that transpired in the wilderness. You see, I mention this because the setting of the narrative is important to note. Because you see, there are questions that one asks themselves depending on their location and circumstances in life. And so this is a wilderness book. And so the Israel, because they found themselves in the wilderness, the Israelites had midbar questions, wilderness questions, because they had been in the wilderness for so long. The wilderness had stole, stolen life from them. And at times, the wilderness made them forget that they were journeying from death in Egypt towards life in Canaan. And so the Israelites found themselves in a place of uncertainty, a place where hope rises in the morning and the forces around you leave you hopeless by the end of the day. A place where generations lived and died and there seemed to be no change. A place of fear where the situation seemed to be deteriorating rather than improving day by day. A place where they watched their loved ones die from famine, from disease, from old age, and yet the promised land seemed very distant. 
a place of wrestling with God and God's will and purpose. A place where they maybe even ask themselves, where are you, God, when we need you the most? And so the book of, of Numbers is a Midbar, a Midbar book, a wilderness book. And I believe it's a book relevant to us today. For we too, on this Women's Month, we find ourselves in the wilderness. These are wilderness times for women. These are times of uncertainty and fear for women. These are times as we begin Women's Month when we ask wilderness questions like the Israelites. These are times when we ask wilderness questions as, as we struggle and wrestle with GBV and the scourge of femicide. These are midbar times when we ask God, what is your plan with regards to women and why do women suffer? And yet, even in the wilderness, we know that God is the God of the wilderness. And he is on the side of the oppressed. And the wilderness one day will be turned into the promised land. And so as we begin this Women's Month, I want you to be conscious of the fact that we find ourselves in the wilderness. I want us to focus on the daughters of Zelophehad who though were in the wilderness, they refused to stay chained in the wilderness mentality and chose to stand up and fight for what they thought belonged to them. The Bible says that a man named Zelophehad, he had five daughters, and Zelophehad died. And his daughters were left without a father, and they were left also without a brother. They had no brothers. It was a girl's house. You would remember that in that context, women were always under the guardianship of their father or a brother or a male in the family. And so without a father, without a brother, they were left vulnerable. Not only were they vulnerable to the forces of nature in the wilderness, but theirs, I would like to propose, was a double, if not a triple burden. They had no protector. You see, friends, there, there are levels to the wilderness. There are levels in the wilderness. You may be of the mind that the whole world is in the wilderness because of COVID-19, because of, of struggles with social ills, because of poverty and many other ills. You may think we are all in the wilderness. I agree, but that does not take away the fact that the wilderness of women right now in South Africa is more intense than the wilderness of men. The wilderness of women is more intense than the wilderness of men. You see, women have to run for their lives. Women are raped, abused, and killed. There are degrees to this wilderness. Women have to duck and dive in the streets and even at home. They have to keep on blocking, block themselves, blocking themselves from abuse, from people who want to take life from them. And in my language, we call that ukuvika, when you defend yourself and protect and shield yourself. And so women have the triple burden whereby we have to shield ourselves, siavika, See, Viga is socialization which at most times elevates the boy child. See, Viga, Ugo fail at school because most times the girl child has more chores than the boy child and they must still perform. See, Viga, e rape even when we walk to school. See, Viga, e abduction and human trafficking. The wilderness has levels. Yes, we are all struggling, but the level that the women is, are struggling in is deeper than that of men. And as you grow as a young lady, unplanned pregnancy, and other diseases, to maintain the standards of beauty that society and media has indoctrinated us with, Uviga e judgment. Uviga e mental and physical and sexual abuse. Yei si aviga. The wilderness has levels. 
And so, the wilderness of the daughters of Zelophehad was intense. Numbers 26 and 27 describes that a census of all the males had been taken. And after the men were counted, the Bible says that God called for the division of the promised land among the males who had been counted. The daughters of Zelophehad were not eligible to receive land because they were females. But you know what they did? They refused to accept this. And they decided to do what Zosbini calls taking up space. And so if I had to give a theme for today's message, it would be taking up space in the wilderness. Taking up space in the wilderness. They unapologetically stood up for what was theirs. And as we begin this Women's Month, there are a few things that I'd like to draw your attention to that we can learn as we seek to take up space in the wilderness. Firstly, they stood together before power at the entrance of the tabernacle. The Bible says they stood at the entrance of the tabernacle and they stood together before power at the entrance of the tabernacle. They couldn't go into the tabernacle. It was not accepted that women would be in the tabernacle. The tabernacle, according to, to the Hebrew Bible, was the dwelling place of God. But this would not be the first time we encounter women at the entrance of the tabernacle. Exodus 38 verse 8 speaks of women who served God at the entrance of the tabernacle. According to Exodus 38 verse 8, these women offered their jewelry and mirrors, their valuable goods, so that these could be used to make ornaments and utensils for the tabernacle. And yet, no matter how much women gave to the life of the tabernacle and the community, they still remained at the entrance and in the margins. And so the sisters stood at the entrance as if saying, Whatever, whatever you think or say, and whether you listen to us or not, we are taking up this space. This is our space and we are going to own it. We will shout from the entrance until you listen to our voices. I want to propose today, ladies, that we are the very same women. We give so much to the community. We give so much to family and church, and yet we remain at the entrance or the exit of the tabernacle, depending on how you choose to look at it. But we must take up space. Whether separate inside or we are in the margins, we must own our space. We are those who are in the majority in our churches and yet we find ourselves at the exit or the entrance of, of the tabernacle depending on how you look at it. She says, Kalein, we are those who carry life and yet we are at the entrance or exit of the centers of power and decision making. We are at the entrance of the tabernacle even when it comes to how much we take home. Because it's a known fact that women and men may do the same job, but you'll find that a man will get paid more than a woman, even though the women might actually be working hard. We give our all to the economy. We give our all so that, so that life can go on wherever we are, and yet we remain at the entrance. And so these sisters stood at the entrance, they stood before Moses, who, who represented the divine law and authority of God. They stood before the priest, who were the mouthpieces of God. They stood before the leaders, who were God-appointed leaders. They stood before the assembly, which would have defended the laws more than the ones who made the laws. And the daughters of Zelophehad, they stood before them, and they took they took up space in the wilderness. Today, I call you women. Women, I call you young and old. This is the time for you to stand and to take up space. They stood and they said, the land is ours. 
No matter what you say, the land is ours. And they claimed a land. Mind you, they were not yet in the promised land. They claim a land that they had not seen yet. But they were clear. We do not want our tomorrow to look like our today and our yesterday. We will take up space in this wilderness. It is time for women to stand and to stand fearlessly in the face of power. It is time for women to take up space and claim that the land belongs to us. We claim the land. We claim a land we have not seen as a matter of principle. We claim the land of our rights as a matter of principle. We claim safety as a matter of principle. That's the destination. That's the land we want. We claim the land of a liberative reading of the Bible as a matter of principle. We claim our jogging space in the streets without fear as a matter of principle. That's our destination. We claim a trip to the mall without being fearful. We claim wearing whatever we want to wear without people groping at us. We claim wearing flat shoes because we are tired and we are just not going to be subjected to self-torture under the name of beauty. As Beyonce says, pretty hurts. Pretty hurts. It hurts to be pretty. As a matter of principle, we have not seen the land. But as a matter of principle, we want it too. That is what the daughters did. So take up space in the wilderness and claim the land. But in order to stand, they had to be of one heart and one way. Their agenda had to be in sync. Otherwise, they would have pulled to all directions. When you stand before power, whether it's before men or before church structures or culture or societal norms, your agenda must be in order or you will fail. There had to be a sisterhood there. And I'm sure that they were of varying age groups, but they came together. It is time for women to come together and realize that it is sisterhood that will strengthen us. And realize that sisterhood is greater than any church position. The positions you've been fighting about, it's not worth it. Be happy when another woman gets appointed for her abilities and stop fighting. Sisterhood is more important than competition. Sisterhood is more important than your status. Sisterhood is more important than, than the man that you are fighting over. Stand together. That is what the sisters did. Stand together and claim what is yours. And so these sisters rattled the hierarchy. And they said, take it to the top. Take it to your God. Take it to God to decide, but we will not stand this. Ladies, arrange yourselves. Arrange your agenda. Arrange your priorities and speak to power. The second thing I want to note about these ladies is this. The land is borrowed from our children. The land is borrowed from our children. John James Adabon once said, the land is not given to us by our forebearers, but it is borrowed from our children. The land is not given to us by our forebearers, but it is borrowed from our children. You see, if they did not fight for the land, it is their children who would have suffered the most in the long run. We can all resonate with the desire for the land and claim for the land, we are those familiar with the land debate. We are those who are familiar with, with the unfairness and injustice of not possessing land or having land stripped away from you. As Africans, we understand land as embracing the ecological, cultural, cosmological, social, and spiritual. We understand as Africans, that land is tied up with our sense of being and identity. That's what they were fighting for. Land is tied up with our God and, and ancestors to the extent that when we buy a house, we, we call upon umvelingangi namadlozi to reside in that space and ward off evil. 
And so when they claimed the land, they were claiming more than just the physical land. They were claiming their identity and the identity of the children to come. They were claiming the identity of all women and girls. And they claimed the space for their children. In fact, in verse 4, they, there was a, realize, a realization of this when they said, why should our father's name disappear from his clan because he has no son? So these sisters fought for land, physical property. But the land is deeper than just a space to build your home. I call upon you to claim a deeper land, for it is borrowed from our children. Claim the land of being an equal at the round table. Claim the land of fair share of respect as those made in the image of God. You see, whatever we don't fight for and claim, whatever spaces we choose to vacate instead of taking up, whatever we vacate, we are robbing our children and the generations to come for we live on borrowed time and borrowed land. And whatever we vacate, our children will lose out. Thirdly, do you, do you and the world will adjust. Do you and the world will adjust. So all along, the, rule, the rulers of society, or the rules rather, favored men from leadership of the nation to who becomes priest, to who enters the tabernacle, all these, they favored men. And maybe the Israelites believed that God was on the side of men and men alone. Maybe that's what they believed. For you see, when you are at a place of privilege and power, it is easy to see things through the eyes of privilege. You think the universe res revolves around you. In fact, you are convinced that God is one of you. You are God and God is you. You start believing that. God in your ears sounds like your own voice. Through your eyes, God sees as you see. That's what happens when you're privileged. So I'm sure that when Moses went before God with the demands of the daughters of Zelophehad, he was certain that they were wasting their time. In his thinking, maybe he was convinced that God's ruling would favor men. For you see, the demands from these sisters, they disturbed the boys' club. It would cost the boys' club if these women's demands were met. The property of men will have to be adjusted and become smaller so that these women could get land. But these ladies didn't care. Do you and the world will adjust. If women today demanded the land of their bodies, men would have to control their sexual appetites. Do you, the world would adjust. If women today demanded the land of leadership positions, men would have to let go of what they've held on to for so long. Do you? If women today... demanded the land of self-worth, men would have to adjust their speech, which commodifies women. Do you? If women today demanded the land of their dignity, men would have to adjust and realize that women deserve better. Do you? And the world would adjust. And lastly, as we reflect on Numbers 27, I would like to draw your attention to God, who is the restorer of dignity. So Moses comes before God after hearing the requests and the demands of these sisters where at the entrance of the tabernacle. And, and Moses goes before God and brings the resolutions of these sisters who demanded an amendment to the property laws. And because there is a God, the resolution is accepted. God affirmed and restored the dignity of women that day. For women too are made in the image of God. It was after all the dignity of God that was bestowed upon us at birth and at creation. 
Sizelwe sembete umfanegiso no mfuziselo of a living God and it was stripped of us. That is what they demanded. Thanks be to God that there is a restorer of dignity. You see, God formed women in God's very own image and breathed life into her. And so God has not for once deemed or placed women as inferior, but it is the one bestowed with masculinity who has assumed the place of privilege. And in the process has used culture, traditions, policy, scripture, and practice to legitimize what they do. But there is a God who restores the dignity of women. The God who is the restorer of dignity, we learn, continues to do this in Scripture. The Bible says that through, through Jesus, God walked in this earth. It was the womb of a woman that became the vessel of God walking amongst people. For there is a restorer of the dignity of women. There is a restorer who is seen, seen healing the woman with a flow of blood. There is a restorer who is seen setting free the women caught in adultery. There is a restorer who chose to reveal the risen Christ to women and they became custodians of the gospel. Thanks be to God, there is a restorer. And the restorer still does that today. He does that. When we are stripped of our rights and dignity as women, and, and the rights and dignity become just lip service, the restorer says to us this women's month, rise up, daughter of the high God, take up space in the wilderness. I'm not saying that the world is perfect, and that South Africa is ready for you to be vocal, or that the church is ready for you to be vocal, but take up space own your space wherever you are, and I will do the rest. Take up space at work and, and be proud, and I will do the rest. Take up space when you look in the mirror and say, this is me. There's only one of me. I'm a brand. Take up space in the church and allow God to use you as a leader. Take up space in the home and refuse to watch when injustice is, is committed or done in the name of culture. There is a restorer, but you must step up first. Trust God and be willing to face the consequences. The daughters of Zelophehad did something that no one had dared to do before. They took a risk, they stepped out of their comfort zone and were not afraid of the consequences of their action because there is a God who is a restorer of your dignity. And he will be with you no matter what. My encouragement to you as you begin this Women's Month, do not be imprisoned by the fear of the consequences of fighting for what is right. Because women continue to be imprisoned by fear. Do not be afraid of the consequences. If it means that you would be deemed as a stuck-up feminist when you, voice, when you voice your thoughts, very well, but there is a restorer. If being career-driven and ambitious will lead people to say you are stuck up, very well, but there is a restorer. If it means losing your comforts, your money, your social status for the sake of wanting more and wanting better and knowing that you deserve better, very well, but there is a restorer of your dignity. It is women who refuse to be in the margins. It is women who are fearless of the consequences of standing up for truth. These women, those are the ladies that we celebrate today. And we encourage those who are still fearful to take up space in the wilderness. I conclude, friends, by saying to you, whatever is oppressive, whatever is destructive, whatever is offensive, whatever is dismissive in your life, stand against it. Take up space in the wilderness. Conditions may not be favorable, but take up space. And the restorer of your dignity, your God who made you in his image, will do the rest. He will carry you in his everlasting arms as you face the consequences.
Lingisa um Peter and say, Uma gungu and go see, Ishongise, Gihamba Pesgua Manzi. I am hesitant, Lord, to step out of the boat of temporal comfort. I am hesitant to leave the familiar. I am fearful of what's on the other side of being vocal, of taking that decision. I am hesitant, but I will take up space in the wilderness. Uma gungu, Ishongise, and Hamba Pesgua Manzi. May you be strengthened. May you take up space and realize that there is a difference. There is a difference between taking up space and filling up space. So refuse this Women's Month. Refuse to just be a bunch of women who are full at church. But be women who will make a difference. Women who are impactful, positive, productive, self-developing, community-developing, transforming, godly, assertive. That is what taking up space is all about. I'm not talking about filling up spaces here. Women who will leave a legacy for the generations to come. For the land we live in is borrowed from our children. May God strengthen you and bless you as we do that. Amen. Let us pray. We give you glory we give you praise. We adore you, God. And we thank you for making women in your very own image. We thank you for the fact that before we were formed, you knew us because you formed us. We thank you for the fact that before we even came into the world, you knew us. And you continue to be a God who journeys with us, who knows us. And as we begin this Women's Month, si atanda zangosi, si atanda zelangosu kutula wako, ezwe nlagiti. Si atanda zelangosi for healing, where women have been hurt, broken, and discarded. We pray, O oh Father, that you will speak into the hearts and the minds of those who are perpetrators of abuse, rape, femicide, and all forms of violence against women and children. We pray for your healing hand upon our land. And heal our land. But in the very same breath, we want to celebrate. We want to celebrate the, the strides that society has made when it comes to recognizing women. We want to celebrate the Methodist Church who has their first female presiding bishop. We want to celebrate the increasing numbers of women in parliament and in spaces of leadership. We want to celebrate, our oh God, mothers, sisters and daughters who are doing their best to raise up good children, good sons and daughters. We want to celebrate the mother who wakes up at 4 a.m. to get into a taxi and go work so that their children may eat. We want to celebrate our Lord, strong women, and recognize in the very same breath that women too get tired. And so at times we want to come before you and say we are tired of being superwomen. But you have not called us to being superwomen. You have called us, oh God, to be your children. And you, the restorer, will carry us. So be, oh God, be that cape of a superwoman. Be that cape that will shield us from storms. Be that red cape of superwoman that will shield us from hurts and disappointment. Be that cape that will help us to soar, to fly, to reach for our dreams. For we do not want our today and our tomorrow to remain the same. Bless this month. Bless the services that will take place. And may you speak a word of life to women. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.